It's up front if anybody would like to. Uh... Uh, well done. Uh, good afternoon. It's great to be back in Copenhagen. I was here just a few months ago. I guess I uh, keep coming back for the uh, Schmorbrod. Uh, those are traditional Danish sandwiches, if you don't know. Does this not work? We'll do it that way. Is that better? Okay. Everybody can hear? You want me to do the Schmorbrod again? <laughs> See, the second time it was easier. Uh, today we have some of America's most forward-thinking climate leaders here, and we're going to hear from each one in a minute. Uh, but first, let me tell you what brings us all together. Uh, each of the mayors here was a winner in a national competition that Bloomberg Philanthropies created called the Bloomberg American Climate, Cities Climate Challenge. Uh, the idea was simple. We said to mayors, you propose replicable, common-sense plans for reducing emissions and fighting climate change, and we will back the best plans and provide resources and expertise to help implement them. We invited the 100 largest U.S. cities to participate, and ultimately we selected 25 winners from each corner of the country. And each of the winning cities shares at least two common traits. One, they have the political leadership necessary to fight the tough battles and push to do the right thing. And two, they are taking action, specifically in the building and transportation sectors. The, these are the two areas where mayors can make the biggest impact on climate change. Of course, even more cities can and should follow these leaders' footsteps. Um, and what we're doing is to make sure that that happens. Today, for the first time, we release the, 13, the 30 proven strategies that our winning cities are implementing. This new policy playbook is available at Bloomberg.org slash climate challenge and you'll see it up there. Uh, and it provides a roadmap to fight the climate crisis, reducing air pollution and improving people's lives. We hope it will be of use to mayors everywhere. And the fact is climate change is a series of solvable problems and this playbook can help solutions spread around the world. So let me give you a little bit of an idea of the impact that cities can make. Our analysis shows that if the 100 largest US cities adopted the strategies from this playbook, their total combined, commit, combined emissions would drop by nearly 30% by the year 2025. And that would result in carbon reductions of 224 million metric tons. And that's the equivalent of taking nearly 50 million cars off the road or shutting down nearly 60 coal-fired power plants for an entire year. And it would mean a lot more people breathing cleaner air and living healthier lives. Here's another reason why we think this work is significant. The nearly 30% reduction that the 100 largest cities can achieve would exceed the target that the U.S. set under the Paris Climate Agreement. That target was 26 to 28% by 2025. So even as our federal government tries to drag us backwards, American cities can continue to lead from the front and get the job done. And I want to thank all the mayors who contributed to the playbook. Uh, I also want to thank everyone on this stage, especially for making the trip and uh, for their continued leadership on such crit a critically important issue. So now let me turn it over to one of the winners of the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge. Uh, last year I had the chance to visit her and the great city of Seattle. Her work on energy efficient buildings and transportation strategies has helped put Seattle at the forefront of this issue. Mayor Jenny Durkin, would you say a few words? And then afterwards, she's going to pass the baton or a microphone or whatever down the line. Ending with Grossetti, is that correct? I think we can end there. Anyways, you want to do it? Are you rushing off some of Oh, OK, fine, OK. So she's a long pass. Throw it to him. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bloomberg, and to all my fellow mayors uh, up here on the panel and in the audience who are really committed to action on climate change, thanks for all you're doing. Mayor Garcetti, thank you for assuming the leadership of this great conference and all you're doing on the West Coast to fight the good fight. Mayor Bloomberg, Seattle, we have been honored to receive the support of you and the Bloomberg Foundation and Philanthropies 
Um, we know that your work across America and across the globe is making a difference and showing that America cities can make a difference. We are here because we know that in Seattle and across the globe, climate change is one of the gravest threats we face. And unlike our federal administration, we don't have the luxury of climate denial, nor can we wait. From wildfire smoke that chokes our air during the summer, to droughts and rising sea levels, to changing weather and unprecedented natural disasters, in Seattle we are already seeing the devastating impacts of climate change. And those devastating impacts disproportionately deal damage to those underserved communities, low-income communities, and communities of color. They are the communities hit the hardest by climate change, not just in America, but across the globe. It is a national and global crisis that threatens the health of our children, our health, our economies, and our security. We know we must do better and cannot wait. I am so honored to be here with all my fellow mayors to show that cities can stand up and make the difference. Whether or not our federal government was willing to act, we know we could not reach the goals we needed if cities did not act. We will act. We know that we cannot wait for the other Washington. We like to think of Seattle's being in the better Washington. That's why we're expanding in Seattle. We're making sure that we expand access to transit for all communities and have started a program where every Seattle public school student gets a free transit pass. We're investing in housing, particularly near transit. We're electrifying our transportation system and our fleets. We're making sure that our building sector is more efficient and more green and carbon free. We're increasing access to safe pedestrian and bike infrastructure, although being in Copenhagen, I think all of us feel humbled on that front. Um, yeah, right, we can give Copenhagen a big hand for a lot. Um, it's been inspiring to be in this city to see what is possible, and also inspiring, one of the most inspiring things that I've been able to do is yesterday engage with a panel of youth from around the globe and see their energy, their activism, demanding that there be change. We know that change is not possible if that generation does not rise up and put pressure on the rest of us. Our obligation is to them and to their futures. As we continue to act, we know that our climate challenges fall disproportionately across the globe and in our country on those who can afford it the least. So as we craft solutions, we must make sure those solutions themselves are just. No one knows better than Mayor Bloomberg that the job of the mayor is to think not just about tomorrow, but the next generation and the generation after that. In Seattle, we literally are rebuilding our city, so we have the opportunity to build the city we want and the future that we need. I'm really honored to be here and could not be more honored than to turn over the microphone now to a true leader in America and across the globe, the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. So this is my fourth of 19 speeches, so I'm going to keep it brief because you're going to hear a lot from me. But um, thank you so much, Mayor Durkin. You have been a dear friend and a great inspiration, and it's, I'm proud to be West Coast with you. So uh, we've got Portland, Seattle, and LA repping the West Coast today. Um, you know, West Coast, best coast, but we love you guys as well. Although I think Mayor Caldwell would say I'm truly the West Coast, but that's a different one. But whether from Portland to Philly, from Boston to Austin, from San Antonio to Seattle, from La La Land to Honolulu Land, we are all up here to really celebrate um, not only the work that is happening in American cities, but to thank also Bloomberg Philanthropies and Mike Bloomberg for their visionary leadership. We're competitive by nature. We run for office. But we're competitive in a good way as well. Uh, we look for those ideas that are in other cities, and we want to take them back to our own. And part of what I love about being an American mayor is in the United States now, we have 435 mayors who are a part of climate mayors, which is part of what Mike Bloomberg described. Cities, um, universities, businesses that are stepping up to fill the void uh, that has been left by our president. And when Donald Trump said, we're getting out, we all said, we're jumping in. And that's what this is about, whether it's a zero emissions zone in Los Angeles, our building codes. I've always told people it didn't matter who got elected president as much as who is the mayor uh, in your city. 
if it was President Hillary Clinton who had won, 80% of the work still would have been with these mayors in these cities. Um, and whether it was Mayor Walsh hosting us in Boston for climate mayors, Mayor Caldwell in Honolulu this past year, and each one of these mayors who has taken brave moves forward, whether it's around food and nutrition in, in uh, Philly, whether it's in walkability and bikeability in Portland, uh, whether it's the work in um, um, Austin to build public transportation and more, these are the folks that are pushing that bar forward. So thank you uh, to Bloomberg for pushing us to be even more competitive, but in the right way in a way that we can look back and say this was the, that climate, climate decade, that decade of action, and a moment when we took this Green New Deal idea, which Washington will probably debate for another decade while we're enacting it at the local level. Um, and I love San Antonio. I didn't mean, mean to leave you out either. But let me toss it over to my dear friend who uh, brings aloha wherever he is. He hosted all the mayors of America recently at the U.S. Conference of Mayors and really did an extraordinary job the day before with climate mayors where we came together to talk about, too, how we could do things from electric vehicle purchasing uh, together to the way we could uh, control our building codes, which is the biggest emitter anywhere in the country. And we are so proud to have his leadership and the longest flight probably here of anybody. Please welcome Kirk Caldwell. Good afternoon and aloha. aloha. I tell you, it's, uh, it's a little tough about an hour ago. It's now 2.30 in the morning in Honolulu, and you know I want to go to sleep in a way. But being here with all the mayors is a great thing. And a um, couple things. I felt so much pride you know, watching the passing of the baton this morning you know, from a great mayor. I mean, one of the greatest cities in the world, Paris, to a great city on the West Coast, Los Angeles, the mayor Garcetti. And you know, two great leaders. Um, working close together, and I think the best example you can see of that is how they resolved who is going to get the Olympics. And I thought, and it's funny in one way, but I was telling Mayor Garcetti, he showed real grace in terms of working something out where Paris got the Olympics 100 years after they last hosted it. But LA gets it afterwards. Mayor Garcetti won't be mayor. He may be something else by then. But that shows a willingness to compromise for the better of everybody. And today is much about that. What do we do as, as mayors uh, in the United States, but also around the world? Um, and I wanted to thank Mayor Bloomberg for his leadership with all of us in terms of helping our cities become on the forefront of addressing our climate crisis, climate emergency. But I also was thinking, I, want to, I think we all need to thank him for what he's done in terms of leadership on things like tobacco, on smart gun control, and now on climate change. I mean. He's someone who steps up, has great courage, but then puts money behind it and leads around our country, getting mayors to find courage if they don't have it, and if they do, to give them a platform to step forward. So just some comments. You know, I was thinking, as uh, the two other mayors were talking, you know, City and County of Honolulu, it's a small place. It's smack dab in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, a fleet of islands further away from any other major landmass anywhere in the world. We haven't done a lot to contribute to the climate crisis. Um, our small population. And some may say, why are we putting so much effort? Because each of us, starting from individuals to communities, need to do their part to turn this around to save our planet. In our case, we call it the blue planet, surrounded by this Pacific. You know, in the past this couple of years, Category 5 hurricanes, at 1.3 traveling south of the Hawaiian Islands, you know, almost impacting our islands. Rain bombs, you know, seeing almost 50 inches of rain fall in a 24-hour period, more than ever recorded anywhere in the world. Our trade winds, which are national, uh, natural air conditioning, have diminished dramatically. And we saw 30 days of summer that broke records. Very, very unusual. And of course, sea level rise, you know, just an inch huge erosion on the north shore of the island I'm the mayor of, is seeing homes collapse into the water, coconut trees fall into the water, and it's just, just starting. So under our challenge, you know, we're addressing carbon neutrality. We, have, we want to have a carbon neutral corridor. So we're rating, building our first inner city rail system in the history of, of our islands, and it's the same system that you can travel on here in Copenhagen. It looks almost the same. It's going to start running by the end of 2020, the first 10 miles of the full 20 miles. And what's cool, what's different than Copenhagen? We insisted there's surf racks in the train. <laughs> so, but along that corridor, besides trains, we, we train, we have, it's going to be all electric, driverless. Uh, we put in, you know, bike lanes, protected lanes, like here, just starting. We established bike share. It's called Bicky. It's now the sixth most heavily used in the country. It's a little over a year old, so a lot of demand there. 
Um, we're converting to all electric buses. We are promoting a lot of walking and we're planting hundreds of thousands of trees. We made the commitment, we started to do that. That's all our part. One, to make sure we thrive on our small island of Oahu, but also do our part for our planet so we can continue to be that blue planet and in our case, the blue continent surrounding Hawaii. Thank you so much. I'm next gonna introduce the mayor of San Antonio. Um, come on up and say a few words, if that's okay. Mayor Garcetti, are you introducing? Okay, good. All right, come on up. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Nuremberg, mayor of San Antonio, Texas, the seventh largest city in the United States, and the cradle of Texas independence. Two years ago, in my first act as mayor, I committed, to our, I committed our city to the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Next week, on this day, we will ratify a climate action and adaptation plan that paves the way to carbon neutrality by 2050. I'm thrilled to be standing here with my colleagues across the country as we push forward for aggressive climate action across the United States. The science is clear that we have to act now and I'm grateful to Mayor Bloomberg and the Bloomberg team and the Climate Cities Challenge as, we, as they help us accelerate transformation change in our building and our transportation sectors in particular. When I return to San Antonio a week from today, I'll oversee a city council vote on our first ever climate action and adaptation plan that calls for decarbonizing our energy supply, building a multimodal integrated and electrified transportation system, improving building efficiency, and doing so on a foundation of social equity and climate justice for the most vulnerable members of our community. I look forward to sharing best practices with my fellow mayors as cities continue to be on the forefront of climate action. So San Antonio is not the city that people usually think of when they think of climate leadership. We're in the middle of South Texas, we're on the doorstep of some of the world's largest fossil fuel reserves in the world. But that's why it's so important that we work together and that we succeed and that we do it now. We can create the future that we want and in San Antonio we will. And if we can, all of us can. So now let me toss it over from uh, Texas independence to American independence and the great mayor of Boston, Massachusetts, Marty Walsh. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. And um, uh, it's great to be here with, with all, all of the mayors from America here today. Uh, this, this conference is really remarkable and it's important. Um, a lot of questions, I was in a press conference earlier today, and a lot of questions were focused around governments, national governments that are not part of, of C40 and not part of the Paris Accord. And um, when you look at all of us here and 435 other mayors, uh, Mayor Gasset talked about uh, actions happening in America. Actions happening from coast to coast, and I want to thank the mayors that are here with us today. But I also want to congratulate Eric Garcetti uh, on, on becoming the head of C40 um, in the great work we're doing. Um, I want to thank Mayor Bloomberg as well. Um, it's important um, that Mayor Bloomberg is such an important voice in climate resiliency. Uh, I want to thank him for awarding Boston last year with an American Cities uh, in the American Cities Climate Challenge, uh, and. What we did with the money is talked about a climate action plan, a, a roadmap to carbon neutrality. Uh, we're putting a major focus on building and transportation because that's where the majority of emissions come from in our cities. Uh, the, the, the funding helped us support the climate action plan. All, uh, we announced this the other day, all city owned buildings in the city of Boston uh, will be carbon neutral. We also launched new energy efficient programs for existing municipal buildings in the city. It's important for us to start with our buildings uh, and, and lay down the foundation for what we want to do moving forward. We're leading by examples because we're working with developers to develop standards to decarbonize large buildings all over the city of Boston. Uh, I think the number of buildings that we have to decarbonize completely to, I think it's around 70,000, 70, 86,000 buildings, uh, just, a, just a few. Uh, we also want to improve incentives for small buildings. We're developing carbon, uh, net zero carbon requirements for all new construction projects. In Boston, we are and we have to continue, in America, have to continue to put people first. We need to protect our most vulnerable. We need to avoid driving up costs of housing. That's why we've created guidelines for zero net carbon emissions for city-funded affordable housing. In transportation, it's another focus of ours. 
we must make walking and biking, and as Mayor Durkin mentioned, um, you know, I, was, I have notes here to talk about my new bike lanes, but I can't even go there uh, <laughs> with this city. But, but it really is, when you think about when you walk around the city here and you get a chance to really see the city, uh, I get excited to go back and really talk to people and to be able to tell firsthand knowledge of other cities what it could be like. So when we have our naysayers saying we're building these dedicated bike lanes, we talk about what's going on. Um, this really, oh, I'm repeating, we're repeating a lot of things that is being said to each other. But I think it's important to tell the story of what's happening in cities in America. And I think it's also important for all of us to share ideas. Mayor Garcetti talked about a competition. It is a competition. It's a competition because we want to make sure that we're the first and the best in that. And we drive each other to be better as mayors. But we don't take it personally. We work with each other as well so that we can share best practices. And that's what this is really all about. So I want to thank all of my colleagues that are here today. Um, I thought our Mayor Garcetti was going to talk about sports when he talked about driving. So I'm, I'm not going to go there because the guy up after me is going to go after me. But um, <laughs> I, want to thank, I want to thank the C40 network. I want to thank all the people in this room today. Not everyone in this room is press. A lot of you are staff. We get a chance to stand up here and, and talk to the press, and we get a chance to sit on the stage and talk to the folks in the audience, but a lot of you do the work that are in this room. And on behalf of all the mayors here, I want to thank all of you, the staff of C40, of climate mayors, of a mayors that's here, so thank you very much. Now I have the great honor of introducing a dear friend uh, from the city of brotherly love, Mayor Kenny from Philly. Thank you, Mayor Walsh. Um, we've, we've developed a relationship that's almost like we're, we're, we're related somehow. You know, it's the same ethnic background, sports, we're all competing with sports, uh, but it's a wonderful city and I thank you for, for the introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a, great to be here today uh, with my climate mayor colleagues. I want to also thank Mike Bloomberg for his support and leadership in the American Cities Climate Challenge. We would not be, at, we would not be here without him. Today, we demonstrate again how cities are taking the lead on climate when the federal government continues to stand on the sideline and throw rocks. We know that while cities account for the bulk of global carbon emissions, they are also major drivers of cl climate solutions. That is why in Philadelphia, we are leading efforts to tackle the global climate emergency through policies that are equitable and effective. We already have a plan to reduce carbon emissions 28% by the year 2025 in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. But thanks to Bloomberg Philanthropies, we are accelerating our efforts. By the end of next year, we will be much closer to meeting that goal. Right now, we are scaling up energy efficiency projects across homes and the city's largest commercial buildings through policies, programs, and job training. We are also working to dramatically increase the generation and use of renewable energy. That this is being done through supporting clean energy procurement programs with some of our largest companies. Last December, I signed a bill to enable Philadelphia to enter into a power purchase agreement to buy solar power. The agreement will result in the construction of a 70 megawatt solar facility, one of the largest in Pennsylvania. Through the contract, Philadelphia will purchase all electricity produced at that site, about 22% of the city's government's load, for 20 years at a fixed rate. The project is key to having 100% of the city's electricity come from re renewable sources by the year 2030, a goal set forth in our municipal energy master plan. We know that our transportation network is also a big contributor to emissions, so we have plans to address that as well. Our plan calls to increase trips by bicycle, walking, and transit by 5% by the year 2025, or sooner through the implementation of our strategic transportation plan. And we are working to accelerate the transition of 6,000 municipal vehicles to electric, while also collaborating with our transit authority, SEPTA, to electrify its entire fleet. Philadelphia is proud to partner with Bloomberg Philanthropies to scale up our climate action, protect our most vulnerable residents, and create a healthy, vibrant, and just city for the future. And I want to say I'm very happy that this event was held in Copenhagen. Um, when you travel around the city or you see the architecture, we were at a boat tour yesterday, you see what's possible. You see what intelligent people can do if they, if they really think about how design affects everything. Uh, and it was really wonderful to see it, and I am also very jealous of their bike lanes. It's, it's, <laughs> I do like their traffic signals, though. It, 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 gives, you, it gives you enough time to cross the street. Um, so, so I want to thank everyone for being here. We have a lot of work to do, and uh, we'll, we'll get it done. And I want to now call up uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler from Portland.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. History has found us. And at a time when the politics of division seems to want to divide us, we've been brought together by some really amazing leaders. And at the top of that list is Michael Bloomberg, who time and time again finds ways to bring us together to address some of the most significant challenges facing our planet. And I want to also thank Eric Garcetti for his incredible leadership and uh, I was so happy to hear, Eric, that you're going to take the helm as our, our new chair for C40. And I know that you will achieve great things, and you'll do it with all of our help and support. So thank you for that. My name is Ted Wheeler, and I'm the mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon. I have to say, uh, speaking of the moment in history, the Trump administration has walked us back from where we wanted to go. The Trump administration has said that we are not going to adhere to the commitments that the United States previously made around the Paris Accords. Well, I'm here with these great leaders and many, many others from around the world to say we are still in. And when it comes to addressing zero carbon emissions, my city, these cities, and the many, many people who are activists and leaders from around the planet who've come here to be part of this conference, we've all said the same thing. We only know one direction to go, and that's fast forward into the future towards that zero emissions future. And I speak with the burden of history on my shoulders. Portland, of course, was the first city in the United States to have a carbon reduction plan. And we were very successful over decades in that plan, through a myriad of strategies, we reduced our carbon emissions, both in gross terms as well as on a per capita basis. But I've got to be frank with you. In recent years, we have seen that success start to level off. And in particular, what we're seeing is around transportation, we're seeing emissions continue to grow at a greater rate than population is growing. So, in a sense, Portland serves as both an inspirational example of what a city can do to reduce carbon emissions even as the population grows, even as our economy grows, but we also serve as something of a cautionary tale in terms of needing to continue to work together and continue to innovate and push forward towards that zero carbon future. And that's why we're here. Collaboration is key. And that's why I brought the head of our largest electrical utility here. That's why I've traveled here with the head of our transit agency. We want to learn from these cities and from others. How do we fast track our transition towards zero carbon electricity? And how do we fast track and find new innovative ways to encourage people to use mass transit and get out of their cars and be more economically sound and globally uh, environmentally sound? And it's the Bloomberg American Cities Challenge that's really brought us together, convened us, give us the technical experience that we need, help us share some ideas from other areas to help us address specific strategies around transportation and housing. And in doing this work, what we are trying to bring to the table is putting front and center historically underserved and dispossessed communities who have been disproportionately impacted by climate change. Now, as we develop our fifth iteration of our climate action plan, and as we work with Bloomberg and these other fantastic mayors and leaders around the country, what we are actually doing is putting those frontline communities front and center in our planning, in our goals, and in terms of the outcomes that we have to achieve. And so we're looking to develop tools and incentives to help create more space on our roads so that people can gain access to faster mass transit and also safer bike lanes. And we also want to encourage people to use those tools and get out of their cars. This month we're also kicking off what I believe is a very visionary strategy around price or a visionary conversation around pricing strategies that we think is going to help make our transportation system work much better for everyone. And finally, we're working with those frontline communities that I described a moment ago to develop, construct, and operate community solar. Because we know community solar strategies, and Mayor Garcetti's had good success with this in Los Angeles, those types of strategies actually help create that just transition to 100% renewable energy. Finally, I just want to say this. Thank you to Michael Bloomberg, 
Bloomberg Philanthropies, and the American Cities Climate Challenge. You have given us this opportunity to showcase the great work we're doing in Portland, and we're proud of it, but it also gives us the opportunity to learn from other communities and to be pushed, and so that all of us collectively, together, we can rise to meet the challenge that history has put before us today. And that's really the exciting thing. Eric, that letter that you talked about earlier today, being at the top of the receding glacier, I know that 200 years hence, people will know that we did take the action here. They may not remember any of us, or they may not remember that any of us were even here, but they will know with certainty that we did the right thing when the historical challenge was placed before us. And you all at Bloomberg have helped us to do that. Thank you. And now, I have the honor, and I, I don't want to start a brawl here between you know, different cities, but I have the uh, honor of introducing Steve Adler from the city of Austin, and I happen to believe they have the best barbecue in the United States of America. <laughs> I'm not supposed to, I, don't, I don't know that you're supposed to lead with barbecue at a C40 uh, <laughs> meeting like this. You know, it's hard to believe that after, uh, after uh, uh, eight or nine mayors have, have already spoken that there's actually something still yet to be said. And, and I know with confidence, since the room is full of staff members, that they know that to be true. Uh, I want to just real quickly add my, my thank and appreciation to, to Michael Bloomberg and the foundation. I'm not sure there's anybody in the world that has ever done as much for cities uh, as he has. Uh, not only in climate change, but in so many different ways, uh, uh, incredibly generous and has pushed my city to do things and helped my city convene in ways that we wouldn't have otherwise. I also want to congratulate um, uh, my friend, the, the, the new chair, uh, soon to be the, the person who has done more for cities than, than anyone else in, in, in this role, because uh, I think it's that critically important, and I think this moment in time uh, is so absolutely uh, uh, critical. Uh, you know, cities are the uh, incubators of innovation. They are the uh, uh, economic engines, uh, not only of our of our countries, but of our of our of our world. Uh, what was the number I think you used today in your speech? Ninety percent. We're on a track for where ninety percent of the world inhabitants are going to be uh, uh, urban uh, uh, dwellers. Uh, and you can feel that movement towards cities, uh, which gives cities that additional sense of responsibility. You know, I can remember as a relatively new baby mayor uh, going to uh, Paris uh, to sign the court on behalf of my city, an incredibly proud thing to, to do. Uh, everybody thinks about that event, or most people do, as being a collection of international nation states. Uh, not everyone knows, certainly you guys know, uh, that at that same time in Paris there was a meeting of mayors. Uh, and it was the largest, I understand, collection of mayors in one city, in one place, in the history of the world, uh, convening to discuss climate change and to agree amongst one another that we would do what was necessary in order to, to, to mitigate this climate change. Even at that time, we were in Paris before the thought that there would be any country in the world that would uh, pull themselves out of, of the Paris Accord. Even at that point, it was recognized that cities were responsible for delivering half of the climate mitigation that was going to take place. And that makes sense because cities are closest to the people. They're making purchasing decisions. They're making ener energy generation decisions. They're making mobility decisions. They're making land planning use community decisions. They're making decisions that so much impact. Uh, our ability to actually save the world. Uh, and now these cities, uh, uh, cities in the United States, uh, have to, to redouble and refocus on that responsibility which is so clear now and stands in such stark relief given the policies of our federal government. Uh, Austin's trying to do its part. Um, uh, the uh, Austin learned um, uh, just uh, with a report that C40 issued just a couple days ago that we are one of 30 large cities in the world to have peaked uh, with greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, I want a t-shirt that says I've, I've peaked. <laughs> um, now if uh, 
Although I, although I know if any of my three girls came to me and told me that I peaked, it would be an entirely different kind of message and, and feel. I'm not sure that's a t-shirt that will actually catch on. Um, but, but, but many of the cities sitting here today uh, uh, share that uh, distinction with, uh, with peer cities uh, around the world. Uh, we're trying to do our part, and with our challenge uh, grant from the Bloomberg Foundation, we're, 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 we're focusing on, uh, on buildings, we're focusing on demand-managed parking, uh, we're focusing on electrifying uh, our fleets and, and, and uh, our vehicles in our, in our city. Uh, we're in the middle of a land development code rewrite in our city, the first in 30 years, to, to be able to drive a lot of the, the change that needs to, to, to happen. Uh, you know, the, the line that I did learn today that, that I've taken pictures of and it's probably already been tweeted out back in, in Austin is that um, nobody is doing more than cities. Uh, and I think that's true and I think that that is absolutely necessary um, because it doesn't happen otherwise. But the second part of that was that while nobody's doing more than cities, nobody's doing enough. Uh, and that is so, so, so very true. Uh, I am incredibly proud to be standing here with leaders of cities that are, that are trying to pull their weight, that are trying to serve as role models for cities in our country and across the world. Uh, there's a lot of work for, for us to do. Uh, there's a lot of work for other cities to do. There's a lot of work for every one of us to do. Uh, and events like this just redouble that purpose, uh, focus our attention, uh, and together remind ourselves that we're not in this alone and that in very truth, everybody is in this together. So with that, I think that was everything we were going to say. And then my job was to, to point us back that way to, to walk out of the room. Thank you very much. I peace.